South Park is a grassy basin, rich in flora and fauna, that is nestled in the Rocky Mountains at the heart of Colorado. This landscape, crisscrossed by streams and hilly uplands, supports herds of bison, antelope, and elk. In pursuit came early Native Americans. The presence of these indigenous hunter-gatherers over a 12,000 year span is amply recorded in the hundreds of archaeological sites that dot the landscape. Since 2001, members of the South Park Archaeology Project, assisted by community volunteers and students in Skidmore's field school, have been working to piece together the life stories of these ancient native communities. We're in uh, Frisco, Colorado, waiting to get our SUVs to go to the airport to pick up all of the students. This is uh, almost the first day of field school. I brought all the stuff I needed and more. Welcome. Good to see you. Hi. Hello, my dear. Say hi. Hi. I'm a sophomore at Skidmore. My name's Alex Garcia, um, and I'm I'm an anthro major. And I'm really no, I can't wait for this. It's gonna be great. I've never been to Colorado before, so it's a it's gonna be a cool experience. Ready to uh, get this show on the road. For me, as a as an anthropologist, archaeologist, I'm here to try and record the history of the native peoples here. Three Mile Gulch, a remote hilly corner of the park, is overflowing with archaeological sites. This summer, we're working specifically on the identity of the people that uh, inhabited the area known as Three Mile Gulch. This summer, the newest class of Skidmore archaeology students have come from New York to excavate one of these ancient domestic base camps. <laughs> Under the careful instruction of their professor and field director, Dr. Susan Bender, the team could reveal much about the deep history of the native people in South Park. What I hope to be able to do is to cover a complete living floor of a dwelling that hunters and gatherers made when they lived in this area of South Park. Um, ben. I graduated in 2007. Yeah, I uh, got my start at the uh, field school maybe three years ago, I think, 2006. Um, it was my first taste of, you know, actual field work and really enjoyed it. So, uh, kind of been doing field work ever since. So, it's really cool to come back here again and, you know, get to see the site with a fresh perspective. We know that the dwelling that we're targeting is earlier than, than 3,000 years old. How much earlier, we don't know. And another big question is, how old is that dwelling? So a piece of charcoal that, or several pieces of charcoal that we can use to date that dwelling is another big hope for this coming season. Clearly, it was a site people kept returning to and coming back to, but how much time did they spend there, and when did they you know, when do they like to go or all questions that still need answers. Through the scientific lens of archaeology, the group plans to analyze the lives of past peoples. I'm really looking forward to a very exciting field season. We have a great group of students and a wonderful community of volunteers. And, and knowing what I know of the various personalities, I anticipate a, just a really rich array of interpersonal rea uh, interactions over the course of the summer. Students hit the ground running. They spend their first afternoon at their lab in South Park City getting prepped for their first day of excavation. We'll be doing our lab work regularly. At the end of the, at, at the, end of the day, our, um, our classes will consist of being out in, the la out in the field in the morning, knocking off in the field sometime between 1.30 and 2, 
coming back here. It takes about half an hour to get back here from our field site. And then working here till usually about 4.30 or so. And then back to bracking. You know. Pairs are assigned to excavation squares. Those are going to be the units that you're going to be working in, and that's what you're, you're going to do. Now, I have two goals for, for our work this summer. The one goal is to get a, as much of feature two uncovered that we have a sense of, of the shape and extent of that house floor. Okay? I don't think it's likely that we'll be able to uncover the entire house floor because we think it's about 15 meters in diameter. But if we can just open up enough units and get down to it enough so that we get a good section of it, that would be great. The second goal is to get a date on it. Okay, so charcoal is better than artifacts for this particular field season. Dr. Bender wants to let the students know what they are in for. The field presents different challenges from lab class. But in this part of the site, what it's all about are all of these very complex features, very few artifacts, which I find personally real exciting. It's harder, it's a lot of thought work, you're always trying to figure things out. It can also be pretty frustrating, but it's incredible training. I mean, you guys will say at the end of, the, at the end of, of this field school that you worked in some very tricky, intricate um, archaeological situation, wouldn't you say? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And, uh, especially the 21. Back to Breckenridge early so they can get a good night's sleep. To the students, the 6 a.m. wake-up call seems far more daunting than the first day of excavation. At Skidmore, all of the students took an archaeology lab class with Professor Bender, in which they studied all of the artifacts found at Three Mile Gulch. Nice. For the first time, are you guys excited to see it? Yeah. Yeah. I've only seen like a million pictures of it. Pictures <laughs> and read all the documents. <laughs> Walking the steep hill to the site at high altitude is the first challenge of the day. We're in a three mile gulch at the archaeology site. I'm really out of breath. I just carried this thing up this huge hill behind me. We are at the dig site. Um, it's a little crazy just to see this place that I've seen in pictures and then to you know touch the rocks that we've touched in class in their own context, you know, getting my hands dirty. It's a little surreal to go from the classroom setting to the outside setting. Which guys? Oh, these. Yes. These I'm dear. hoping to go to grad school for archaeology, so I'm just trying to soak in as much archaeological experiences as I can. I mean, I've never been further west than like the eastern seaboard till the summer, really. Um, so that was definitely one big incentive in archaeology, the chance to do a field school. I love Sue Bender. Um, you know, just getting your hands on the stuff that we do in lab is an experience. Don't cut, and don't cut the, the tarp. Remember, there are features right under it. First task is to carefully remove the dirt that has accumulated on the plastic sheet protecting the excavation units since the last field school. Three years ago, moment of great drama. We remove the tarp from last, from three years ago and find out how the features survived three years being covered and tromped on by elk and cattle and mule deer, rhinoceros, elephants alike. Feature is a uh, some kind of a human disturbance of a otherwise undisturbed area that 
Um, it could be a hearth, it could be um, a garbage dump, it could be a midden. When you trowel through, through it, it disappears, and so it's a, a delicate uh, memory of past behavior. This is home for the next month. Our square. Our square. That two meter square. We're up for it. In the lab class, we never talked about features because we were only looking at artifacts, but mm -hmm. to actually like go through and destroy the feature ourselves and record what it is, and like our record's gonna be the only thing that exists of this yeah. feature. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, I can't wait to see it when it's dry, because then the yeah, differences in the soil will pop out like the organic stains. Well, me and Kyle are just kind of scared of doing anything at our unit. <laughs> we're supposed to be excavating uh, one of the features right now. We just started, and we just have to figure out how the dirt feels differently in the feature versus outside the feature. And we're just scraping, just scraping a little bit, you know, scraping scared. But here, um, the challenge is like you're in the context. Like you don't have somebody telling you, oh, this was found in this feature. Like you're finding the features, you have to define them yourself. And I think that's the most challenging thing that we have to do. I mean, already we're, we uh, did a center profile and we're just trying to find on the map where one feature ends and the next one begins and there's no like finite answer. Oh, that's a beauty, isn't it, the way that steps out there. Okay. I don't know, the concept of it is pretty easy, but like when you get down to it, like it really does have to be exact, so. <laughs> um, well, just trial and error. <laughs> just like sharpening a knife, says yes. Geneva. <laughs> Go in one direction with the file. And that's all you have to do. And do it carefully so that you don't slice your... Oh, yeah, we're getting it. Okay. Feel that. That edge is pretty good. That's nice. That edge is still a little dull, so maybe you want to get that. I'm filing this trowel to make it sharper so I can get through the roots that we are uh, sitting on here. And it's a uh, big pain, but once we get through, we get to start digging and straining the dirt, I believe, so we can find some artifacts. And then hopefully there's a house floor somewhere under here as well. We've done about a couple of square miles of survey of this area. Um, and we have hundreds and hundreds of sites. Um, we know a lot more than we used to, but we still have a long, long way to go. I mean, it's definitely physical work. Um, we're scraping off the top layer of like, vegetation, which um, is advertised and hopefully is the trickiest part. Um, and right now we're just trying to get uh, like a light topographical um, drawing map. You know, mapping isn't hard, it's just uh, intricate and precise activity that can get frustrating. Everything we're doing is destructive right now, so good notes and good mapping is the only way to really maintain a, a solid record of what's going on. And it's, it's a whole different ballgame, especially what we're doing compared to what we did in the lab. Um, you know, we're actually excavating and digging down into the dirt as opposed to just, you know, wandering around collecting and washing things and checking out edge bars. As the different it's demands different of the field now. become apparent to the students, the features in the soil that mark the domestic floor starts to become clear for Dr. Bender. You can see the two house floors, 2 and 2A. You can see the organic stains, features 7 and 7A. You can see our post molds that we scooped out are clear as a bell. So no, this is good, and there are other things that aren't so clear, and we'll have to work a little bit to bring them out. Getting here was just amazing, because uh, everyone here spent a semester um, just going through, I don't know how many stone tools, and just pieces of devage I looked at like before coming here. So it was amazing seeing the landscape and seeing where everything came from. Students are experiencing a mix of emotions as they leave the hilltop the first day. They get off just in time to avoid the storm systems that roll off the Rockies each afternoon.
They are in awe of the wide expanse and barren beauty of the landscape, dimensions that could not be communicated by the many images that they had seen in classes. They are also excited to begin the work that they had anticipated for weeks, yet intimidated by the fragility of the archaeological record that will be entrusted to their travels and record keeping. This feature we just uncovered, we took depth measurements and I'm adding them into my map here of the location. Documentation of the features through measurements, maps, notes, and forms is Each vital for pulling the pieces of the puzzle together oh, at the end of the season. On the total station, we'll, we'll be running most of the total Dr. Station. Bender spends the morning setting up this complex mapping instrument. The total station, it plots any point on the site in terms of its distance and, and its elevation from, the, from datum as well. It's what allows us to generate maps of archaeological site of the site. And of course, all archaeology relies on interpreting where things are. Maps are essential to the interpretation of archaeological sites. The spatial relationships that they record reveal the context and meanings of related activity sets, as well as their relative dates. Troweling, mapping, bucketing, sifting, measuring, up the hill, down the hill, this enthusiastic group of students gets used to life on the hilltop, slowly working towards the answers to their questions.